I'm going to modify the talk a little bit. We're always running on the fly, especially when we have fantastic speakers like Dr. Baldwin, who just gave us the pathogenesis and the, the medical treatments for acne um, and how to prevent some of these acne scars. Same disclosures. Nothing has changed since this morning. So in the overview of adult acne, we've talked about this already, right? Dr. Baldwin did a much better job than I can talking about what are the causes of, of acne and whatnot. What I do want to emphasize is that 80% of the world's population has or has had acne at some point in their life. That's huge. We know that 20% of adults suffer from acne, and we know that 44% of women suffer from cyclical breakouts. Why is that relevant? This is a huge aspect of what we can do in dermatology, and we're going to talk about some of that. You already saw this, but this is just a visual of uh, how we talk about the pathogenesis of acne, and this is what I described to our patients. There's four major mechanisms, right? One, of course, like Dr. Baldwin said, it's going to be the overproduction of sebum. That's fine. When you have that overproduction of sebum, you're going to have some blockage, because that's just oil, so you're going to have blockage of that follicular ostia. And that leads to this beautiful, moist environment in which we're going to have the C. acnes grow. All of that, which leads to inflammation, causes some of these nodules and cysts and whatnot. So just like Dr. Baldwin very elegantly showed you, that slide of how you can address each one of those aspects is what you need to remember. And the key that I took away, one of the keys that I took away from Dr. Baldwin's talk is use retinoids. And I worked with uh, Dr. John Wolf and Ted Rosen back at Baylor. They trained me, and that was always a key indication. Every single person should be able to tolerate a retinol or a retinoid or the bucuchiol that Dr. Uh, um, oh my gosh, uh, Julie Harper, Dr. Harper was talking about. How can I, for I, I forget the name, but not a beautiful face, of course. So in terms of hormone-related acne, again, Dr. Baldwin hit on this quite well, but I want you to really think about this diagram because that's important. What we understand is the 5-alpha reductase is going to change, it's going to convert that testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. When there's that dihydrotestosterone increase, that's going to then cause that sebum, the sebum to be overproduced. So all of this is, is related to each other. So you talked about the treatment acne uh, treatments and we have all kinds of treatments, and they don't have to be expensive. For those of you who own your own practices or get to do the ordering in your own practices, you understand that when we talk about chemical peels, how inexpensive they are. Now, the vendors are gonna get upset because we're talking about taking a $80 VI peel and doing the same thing, or it's pretty similar to it, just as long as you understand the ingredients and how to properly put this together for approximately $4 or $4.85. And you order from Delasco, from McKesson. It's just understanding the ingredients and understanding what to look for. But don't forget about that before you talk about technology. I just had a meeting with a general dermatologist. She started a practice in October, and she was asking me, what device should I buy? I need to buy a device. And I said, why? And Dr. Harper's nodding her head because you're in private practice and you understand the numbers. Why? What is it that you feel like your patients aren't, you're not able to treat that your patients are asking for? And she says, browns. I said, are you not doing peels? Well, yeah, but you know, sometimes they ask for lasers. Your point, your job as an educator and as a practitioner is to educate your patients. So understand why. The topical treatments you already saw, and uh, they're all going to increase the cellular turnover, controlled sebum production. Again, I can't talk as eloquently as Dr. Baldwin. So these topicals you need to have in your backyard, in your back pocket, and definitely talking about the um, benzoyl peroxide. I think that's something else that we add. And the question becomes, how do we make these products more cosmetically elegant. That means that we're maybe decreasing the, the dryness of that patient, and that's ways to do it. I always try to take one slide that you want to take home, and this is that take home slide. So if you want to take a picture, take a picture of the slide, because this discusses every, uh, not every, but the majority of ingredients that you're looking for to really treat the different aspects of acne. And I have another slide like this, I think that we talk about for, um, hyperpigmentation. So of course, let's go to the important stuff. What are those in-office treatments that we can do? We have um, all kinds of uh, chemical peels that we can do. We can use an, a topical retinol at the end of one of those peels to enhance those results. It's just about understanding that. And then of course, device-based things that we can use. And I'm not advocating that you go out and buy these, but if you're treating a lot of acne, sometimes it's another good thing to have in your back pocket. And what can we do? Well, we know we can do PDT. Mona, are you out there somewhere? 
Okay, there she is. She's waving her hand, pretty lady in the, in the I don't know what you call it, coral maybe, dress. And uh, so she represents a company that actually gives you the levy, they sell you the levulonic acid that's gonna help with uh, PDT. But what else can we do? We can use vacuum assisted IPL. And so this is just to get an idea of what's out there. This is the second generation. The first generation was, um, uh, Gilly, what was it called? ISO? Isolase, isolase. This is the next generation. So what this is doing, it's actually using a vacuum to pull the skin up and then it's flashing the proper wavelength of light and we see great results. What's so special about this particular device? It also, it has a little, um, needle applicator, so you can put a 27 gauge in needle, and you're like, oh my God, that would hurt if you, you then suck up the skin into there. But what it does, it will help with cystic acne as well. So, and it does not hurt, so we did the FDA trial for them. Anyway, we'll keep going forward. And it, like uh, Dr. Baldwin said, there's different ways to skin the cat. So this is just one other aspect that we can do in somebody who may not want to be using isotretinoin, even though we encourage patients. And always understand when you're picking a device, what's the target? So in this case, with uh, it's it's not just the uh, p acnes, but there's different ways to have materials into the sebaceous gland to then absorb more light. And one of those, are you still using the gold part particles, Dr. Molinari? Yes, he is. They're not available, not being sold. There's another thing that you can do where you don't have to buy any other consumable, you buy the laser. This is a 1064 um, nanometer wavelength. It's a 650 microsecond, which is different than what you're talking about with nanosecond or picosecond. And here's a typical patient. This is actually, uh, she's a 51 year old lady who still suffers from this acne here. She's very, naturalistic. I, would, I don't know why she lives in Texas. She should live in California. But regardless, we're going to provide other treatment options. So she wants a natural treatment option. I said, well, there's nothing more natural than light, right? You live outside. So we're using this. And so you can, if you hear it, it sounds like a vacuum cleaner, but it works quite well. You can switch to a different uh, spot size. We start with a six millimeter spot size to go ahead and um, heat up the entire area. And then we can go over these individual lesions. At nine times out of 10, we can get an improvement, if not a resolution within 24 to 48 hours. So for me, as an impatient guy, as a surgeon by nature, I want something that's going to work fast. And here's an example after the fourth treatment. Uh, there's different ways to utilize this device. If you have severe acne, you're going to be using it once a week um, for four weeks, five weeks, depending on what the patient is doing. Once they go back into complete clearance, what can we do? I always say, you know, come when you see the first lesion and that next time we're going to treat that single lesion complementary. Why? Because this particular device, there's no consumable. So I don't mind doing that. And usually when they're in the office, we talk about other skin care and things to improve their overall regimen. Let's go to the main topic here, acne scars. What can we do for this lovely gentleman? He's 23 years old. He's uh, making real money now. So he comes and he's, the money's like burning a hole in his pocket. So he comes to see me. And he says, what can I do about these acne scars? And the first thing I asked is, well, do they bother you or do they bother your mom? And because he looks like a kid. He said, no, they bother me. I said, well, what do you do? <laughs> he said, I'm a financial analyst. Ah, okay, good. So he's ready to invest in himself. And I don't remember who talked early. Maybe it might've been Dr. Baldwin talking about keloids. Ask the why. Why is somebody there? Because if they're there and you understand their why, then you can figure out, are they willing to invest with you? Because if they're not willing to partner with you, don't do anything. Send them down the road to the med spot. It doesn't really matter. Right? They're not going to be consistent patients and they're not going to partner with you for success. And I always describe to people when somebody comes to our patients, it's, it's, uh, when somebody comes to our office, it's refreshed dermatology, it's like Hotel California. I want you to check in, but I don't want to give you an excuse to check out. And that's why we get good long term relationships with good results because they're willing to partner at that stage in life. So here, the most important thing when you're talking about scars, especially acne scars, is how do you classify it? And these are most of the, I don't know why it says A, A, B, C, A, okay, well, I must have to go back to kindergarten and figure out my alphabets, I apologize. But that being said, you know, what type of scar is this? And if you look at it closely, this is really a, um, a boxcar scar. The next one I'm gonna show you, 
Okay, look at this one. Look at the difference there. If you can see it, hopefully projected properly on the screen. This is what's called a rolling scar. So why is there a difference? I'm gonna hit home runs with rolling scars all day long. It's gonna take me longer to hit a home run using um, different devices or different techniques to help with the boxcar scar. So here's one example of using PMMA, polymethylmethacrylate. And I think it does very well for acne scars. I think it does pretty well for on-label use. I think it's a frigging disaster when you use it improperly in those areas where you have a circular muscle. And the reason I bring that up is because we are a tertiary referral center and we see disasters coming in from PMMA that are sometimes three years out, 10 years out. We have one that's uh, 16 years out. So you can see I'm subsizing. I'm barely putting any of the product inside this little space that we're creating once we subsize. And subsision sounds like such a fancy thing. Get a larger bore needle. You're just gonna use that needle to basically, just like you would inject lidocaine, like you would do a TB injection, and you're gonna be going back and forth. And you wanna go typically from at least two different angles. So 90 degrees are what those uh, angles are gonna be. And you get some good results. So here's an example where it's a little bit of a close-up. Does it project well? I think we have high quality projectors. Hopefully you can see an improvement and you can definitely see an improvement from the 45 degree angle. The reason I put this slide up is because it is not a home run. It's a home run for me because it's pretty well for what the patient wants and he has lost a follow-up because he's happy. And what I tell everybody is to set realistic expectations. And I love when we as physicians or, or um, healthcare providers, we say, you're gonna get a 70% improvement the hell is a 70% improvement? We can measure that if we're going and measuring every single scar, but what does it mean realistically to the patient? And so you have to describe, and I said, we're gonna get between a 50% to 70% improvement. What does that mean for you? That means when you look in the mirror at most angles, you're gonna say, okay, it looks pretty good. What I remind every single person, every single healthcare provider, is that you are never gonna erase that person's memory and emotional trauma that comes from creating that scar in the first place. So make sure you have that realistic discussion. And what I do set as a, uh, at the very beginning appointment, is I tell them, you're always gonna see scars. You're gonna look for the light that you can see those scars in. I'm hoping that you're gonna change some of your, the ways that you hide those scars. If you don't have to put uh, a, um, foundation or makeup to go to the gym, that's one thing. If you have to start using different light angles to find that scar, that's a good thing. So set realistic expectations. What do we do if we have broad areas of scars? Well, we can use collagen, collagen induction therapy. And Des Fernandez first described this in 1995, actually a little bit sooner than that, 1991. Dr. Monavali and I have been blessed to get to work with him and I trained with him using this technique with uh, subcision and uh, getting papers that show this. And so Des talked about this for the first time in a larger conference setting in San Francisco, 1998. So what do we know about collagen induction therapy? And for those in the, um, who understand this, this is microneedling. And we used to bring back in little duffel bags from China and Korea these tiny little stampers and rollers and now you can order them on Amazon from a 0.25 millimeter to a 0.5 millimeter for anywhere from $8 to $12. And I tell patients, yes, you can do this at home, no problem. It's going to help with collagen production. You can do it once a week and then throw it away at the end of the month, order another one. It's so inexpensive. And when you want the heavy duty stuff where you're really bleeding and you don't mind the pain because we're going to numb everything up so there is no pain, then you come see me and we can enhance those results. But you have to understand there's three phases of healing, and any surgeon in this room is going to understand these three phases, but this is how it all works. With that first phase, there's the injury phase, and you know there's going to be a release of neutrophils and macrophages, and there's going to be a secretion of these, these um, chemicals that are going to help bring in that second phase of healing. And those second phase is going to be your fibroblast, your um, fibroblast growth factors, your collagen production with the fibroblast itself. So you're activating the fibroblast to then go and create some of that collagen. We also know, and I'm going to go back one thing, you can see that capillaries are going to form. So that's neovascularization. So anywhere you're treating, expect that it's going to be more red. Remind the patient that you want some of that redness there because that's going to be bringing in more, if you want to call it nutrients or proteins or whatever it is, but it's not that what, that's not really what it is. It's your interleukins and your inflammatory process that's going to come into that area to keep those lymphocytes in place. Then we know that we're gonna have collagen three formation. And one of the things that happens with, at least we think theoretically that happens because we see it by biopsies, that happens with keloidal scars, collagen three turns to collagen one much faster. 
typically within seven to 10 days, sometimes seven days to 14 days. If we can regulate that, and I know that some of the uh, cosmeceutical companies, are, I know one cosmeceutical company is working on this. If we can slow down that conversion from type three collagen to type one collagen, can we prevent keloids? Just something to think about. Okay, one other thing here. So we know that there's some remodeling there and in theory it can happen up to one year. So the question becomes what's the ideal time to have this inflammation inside there. What happens? And again, this is just a technical slide showing what it's doing. With collagen induction therapy, this microneedling, there's gonna be minimal disruption to the surrounding tissue, and you need, do need to understand this. So where do we get that ideal time that we have this uh, cell proliferation and we're keeping those lymphocytes in place for longer? And I'm gonna show you that, I believe, in the next slide. But one of the things you have to understand is how long do these channels stay open? And the reason you need to know that is because when can we put topicals on? When can we put makeup on? When can we put something else as a drug delivery system if we choose to? Let's say again with keloids. And if we're microneedling or using this collagen induction therapy and we're putting a topical triamcinolone, anything that's inexpensive, how can we improve that keloid? How can we improve the texture of the skin? How can we improve our acne scars? So this is the only study that I've seen so far that really shows that it takes about 18 hours to almost fully close those microneedling channels. So when you're choosing when to put your sunscreen on or your makeup on, I typically say one day. In the past, some people used to say, wait two days or three days. Where's the science? There's no science. I used to say in my office, ah, you look fine by four hours. Go ahead and put it wherever the hell you want on. But now we know from science that there's something there. I want you to study this chart just for a second because when we see that second phase of, of proliferation, there's a crossover and you can see where the purple crosses over with the gray and we're going to phase three wound healing. What we do know is that the ideal time to continue to keep those cells in place is if we go over that area the second time. So you do one treatment and when do you do the second treatment? We always say one month. Well, why one month? It depends on where you are in that cycle. So if it's more mature skin, where your fibroblasts have not been producing as effectively as normal, so that's for women, that's between the age of 32 and 34. For men, we're late bloomers, it's between the age of 40 and 42. You may want to do your second session 10 to 14 days later, so you can boost that inflammatory process in that area and keep them there longer and then you don't have a huge reduction by one month. So then your third treatment session is gonna be one month later. So what does this look like? Well, okay, um, in terms of this slide, when was the first FDA clear device produced? That's 2013. I'm sorry, excuse me, 2018. But we started using these motorized devices in 2013, and they used to be class, is it class one originally, uh, Gilly? And now they're class four? Or they were class four and now they're class two. That's what it was, okay. So up until recently, up until 2018, there was only one that was FDA cleared. Now there's three and po there's a fourth one that's coming. So it's just a question of who's done the studies. I'm a geek, I wanna make sure that there's science behind it. God forbid, if there's a complication, the first thing they're gonna ask you is, in a court of law is, well, is this FDA cleared? We know we use things off label, it's not a big deal. So here's a clinical trial that was done. It was based on um, three treatment sessions and you can see there's nice changes there. So it's something that we can consider, right? Hopefully you can see which is the before and the after and I don't have to actually put before and after on there, but regardless, it shows that things can be done. And it's very inexpensive, these devices, and the consumable is very inexpensive. We can also use energy-based devices, right? We have non-ablative lasers, we have ablative lasers, we have sublative lasers is what, we call, what I call them, and that's radio frequency inside a needle. And if you're understanding what the depth is that you're treating, it gives you a better idea which tool that you're going. Oftentimes people say, well, what depth should I be doing my collagen induction therapy? Well, where's the tethering? And how do you figure out that tethering? You can use just a regular old syringe, put some saline in there, put a little bit of fluid, of the saline fluid, which costs you nothing. So a total of maybe $5 or less that you can put a little bit and see, is that tethering deeper or is it more superficial? Just put it directly into that, that little acne scar, whatever type it is, box car, ice pick, and you can get an idea where you want to go. Here's an example of using combination therapy. This is PLLA, so brand name is going to be Sculptra. There's only one PLLA that we use, and it looks painful, but it's not. Why? Because my insertion point, I'm putting 0.2 cc's of lidocaine, and I'm just numbing the insertion point like you would do with an IV. And you can see we're just putting the PLLA in. You can use um, 
uh, this technique, and then I go back and I subsize. Just to give you an idea, because it's numb now, I can go to town, and I'm going in different depths depending on where there's release of that fibrotic tissue that's inside there. Afterwards, I'm using an RF microneedling device, and I'm just using this to generate some heat as well as some um, more breakup of the scar tissue. Right, so not that exciting, it's pretty boring. That being said, the question is, is there science that shows that it works? Well, yes, there's a lot of science, but the first paper that was published on this was in 2009, and we saw that uh, at that time, again, these are smaller studies, as Dr. Harper pointed out very astutely in co the cosmeceuticals portion, what is that small company willing to spend on these, these trials? And unfortunately, it's not millions of dollars. In this case, in a lot of these uh, technologies, it's hundreds of thousands, maybe a million dollars. So it's only 22 people. They were treated with fractionated radiofrequency uh, technology, and we saw that there's some improvement. So when you're looking at these technologies, it's a question of what depth are we going at and what is it that we're doing? And this gives you a good comparison using non-ablative lasers to ablative lasers and um, as well as this precision RF that we call it radio frequency. And the non-ablative, there's one particular company that if you do triple pass at a 1540 nanometer um, erbium YAG, that you can actually get 1200 microns of depth. So that's pretty decent. You also talk about what's the difference between insulated needles and uninsulated needles, and is it a bipolar current or a monopolar current? And all that is based on which device you're choosing and how you're choosing to treat that patient. In broad terms, if you don't understand technology, use an insulated needle with the right company because when it penetrates in, it's gonna be at that depth, or hopefully it's supposed to be at that depth, and it's only generating energy at that depth. So this way we can treat all skin types. So let's say we have a skin type six, doesn't bother me, we're gonna go a little bit deeper. As long as we don't go uh, 0.8 to maybe, so 800 microns to 700 microns, it's less chance of, of disturbing the melanocyte in the uh, basement membrane. And here's the mechanism of action, just to give you a visual on this. Here's the one needle going in, and you can see that it's, it's creating this heat zone. And depending on which depth you are, you can see that's where you're gonna put that coagulation, right? This was published on JDD, and I think, is this one of yours? No, Dr. Manavali is not on this one. He's on most of these, and it gives you an idea that this does work. So again, when we talk about the broad spectrum, you're about to invest $100,000 to $125,000 into one of these devices. That's on the low end of, of investment. Do all of these work the same? Do the needles actually go to the depth? Let's see. This is set at three millimeters. Do you see that there's a bounce off of the skin? This is for a trial that we were doing for a company that's actually got FDA cleared and is selling a lot of these devices and uh, I returned it because I didn't believe that it was as effective as what they were saying. So the question is why, right? And it's all gonna be based on the needle design, the sharpness, and what is the motor that's driving it. Let me see if I can get this thing to work. Yeah, okay, all of these systems were at 2.5 millimeters, and so it's gonna be based on, uh oh let me see if I can make it work, I'm sorry. Let's try one more time. Okay, just watch in slow motion from the left to right because they're all set at 2.5 millimeters. I think, yep, there they go. And let's see which ones actually get to their 2.5 millimeters. And this is just in jello. So it's not like it's even the skin. Crazy, right? So when you look at a device, ask for this study. Ask for what they're doing with slow motion inside jello and see which one is working better. Pretty crazy, huh? Okay, so I don't care about brand names, I care about science. I wanna make sure that if you're gonna invest in something, let's make sure it works the way that they say it's gonna work. So here's an example of a gentleman, and you can see there's some improvement. This is after a single treatment session, and I was just curious, is it gonna make any difference? Because back in uh, 2011, I first treated him as a pharmacy student. So there's some improvement. The other thing that we saw with this is you can also find when you're treating active acne that it does improve the active acne, and the reason for that, it's gonna shrink some of the sebaceous gland. Sound reasonable? How many of you guys treat acne scars? How many of you treat acne? Okay, all the hands go up now, good. It's such a powerful thing that we can do when we treat acne or acne scars, and I wanna share, I hopefully, I think the next uh, slide is a video sharing the impact on a patient. Oh, here's the other side first. 
Can you give me some volume on this, if you don't mind? I was in, I was in elementary school when I was having, yeah, elementary school. All my cousins were like, oh my gosh, why are your skin so oily? I don't know what's going on. And like, my skin was worse than my sister while she was still in high school. I'm like, this is not really good. Uh, um, I kind of lost hope before. I'm like, okay, um, maybe this is how it's supposed to be. And then immediately he's like, we have this new technology. Let's try it out and see how it works. And then a month later, I'm here. And I can't stop smiling. It's, it's a big difference for me. And yeah, so I love it. Nowhere have I ever been um, for my years of experience going from different doctors, to, from doctors, from, from counties to counties, to cities to cities. No one has ever able to treat me as well as, as he has. Yeah, um, this is a direct message to Dr. Twitter. I want to say thank you so much. Um, just since day one, I, you have changed me more on a professional level that made me become, want to become a more positive influence on, on the community as well as a pharmacist. So I can't let you know. You make me a better person. So thank you. So the reason I show that video is just to understand the impact that we can make on patients. I think it's pretty remarkable. So if you have opportunities to help these patients, take the extra time, understand the why, and I think you're gonna get great results. With that, I have four minutes and 44 seconds to answer any questions. Yes, ma'am. Good, the question is, what do I think about microneedling while you're on Accutane? I say do it. The question is, there's a max depth, or is it one, how often do you do it? You can. Uh, I think uh, I still am using the science behind it, especially if it's a younger patient that's still actively uh, breaking out. I think it is an idea to, you know, their collagen production is pretty good at that stage, so let's do it once a month because we know the inflammatory process makes sense. And again, as long as we're not taking or blading the top layer of skin, whether it's with, micro, with uh, true dermabrasion, like old school, where we take the entire skin off, or using a uh, fully ablative laser, I think we have the opportunity to treat safely. And there's been uh, two or maybe three papers that have come out showing that that was old data that we saw in the 1970s where we're using manual dermabrasion um, to remove the entire surface of the skin. So I use uh, every one of these lasers or these devices that I've shown you, I use during uh, isotretinone use. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, you guys can always DM me. So this is the easiest way to contact me. We'll have a, because I've got a lovely young lady who's a practice concierge and she calls me. Answer your email. Okay, thank you, Jeanette. I will do that. Thanks again for having me. Appreciate it.